In a great Britain where the Millennium Dome ended up a complete fiasco, and where the Scottish Parliament building cost a staggering ten times its estimate, on St David's Day, the people of Cardiff will witness a miracle. The National Assembly of Wales. Yes, a major public project, more or less on time, on budget, and it isn't a minger. This £41 million project by star architect Richard Rogers is the linchpin of the regeneration of Cardiff Bay. It's the latest example of what's been going on around the country, the biggest programme of public buildings since the 60s. And for once, it looks as though we've got it right. Just look at its elegant shape, like a modern classical temple designed to be as transparent as possible. The ingenious use of local materials like Welsh slate and even Welsh rain funnelled into the building to flush the loos. Hey, I'll leave that to your imagination. Inside the assembly building, the really greatest feature is this fantastic roof to the debating chamber, which erupts like a giant fountain and then spills over this amazing computer-generated roof. It's really quite spectacular. But to me, I suppose the most important thing is the, the public access to these areas. You can just wander in, come up here, have a cup of tea, lobby your MP. There's a real connection between the people and the politicians. You can look over the balcony here and into, right into the heart of the debating chamber. The debating chamber is designed like a giant funnel to suck all the hot air from the politicians right up there out into the atmosphere and then suck light from the sky down into the centre of the chamber. And it just looks as though it's floating in air. As an icon of national identity, this building's pretty good. So why do I believe it's a failed project? Because the way in which we build public buildings today means it's been tragically compromised. The original design has been watered down. It's on time, on budget, but it's uglier. For instance, there were once to be three of those magnificent show-stopping cowls. After 9-11, the building was beefed up for security, but without real time or money to rethink the whole design. So this foul cross-bracing, fatter columns and coarse window bars were added. Why were these compromises introduced? Well, it's all about budgets and how these projects are run. I think we've got a history, unfortunately, in, in the UK and places where uh, building designs are undervalued. So the original uh, start-up figure um, was perhaps uh, far, far too low. The initial budget was a totally unrealistic 13 million for a symbol of Welsh identity, housing 60 politicians and with tip-top environmental credentials. 13 million? You're having a laugh. That's the price of the children's centre in Lewisham. So the initial budget was raised to something frankly less stupid. Richard Rogers was brutally sacked and only rehired under the condition that he worked with a contractor who made sure they stuck to £41 million. There'd be no Scottish Parliament fiasco here. We determined to get that contract with a contractor that would deliver a building on price. And I think that's been really important for the people of Wales to have that confidence that we intended to do it and we have done it. What's wrong with that? Well, for people like Rogers, it's plonking a contractor between him and his client, in this case the Welsh Assembly, that causes the real problems. If it wasn't the Welsh Parliament, I would not have done it. Because it does not get you the best quality. Not, no, it, gets you the, it may assure you co certain costs, and I think that's very important. But in a way I feel, and I'm obviously an architect, I feel the architect is the one person who can say, you've got to redo that piece of work, it's not good enough. Or we might like to say to the client, that may be the cheapest, but that's not the best. It's much more difficult to say that to the contractor. The problem at the heart of what went wrong with the original bold vision for the Welsh Assembly building, it all comes down to the way in which the building was financed. Now pay attention. This is very dull, but very important. We have two main ways to finance big public projects in this country. One, PFI. That's when a consortium gets together, stumps up the cash, and the government pays them back in rent. The second one is design and build. That's when there's one main contractor who does all the hiring and firing. You're fired. The Welsh Assembly used design and build, but both systems are being used for public buildings, and whichever you choose, both share the same weaknesses. While these buildings get watered down, it isn't just because of the financial restraints on egomaniac architects, but because the very system leaves architects out of the loop and contractors dominating the process, which is crazy. 
All the buildings that we have built, the best buildings, are the ones where there's a very short route between the client and the architect. This is not a short route. It's lucky the assembly was using one of the world's most famous architects, so we ended up with a decent building. But when these funding systems make good buildings go bad, then they really go bad. Take one, costing 78 million, that's barely a year old. Just around the corner from the Welsh Assembly, there's another Victor of Design and Build, a great ugly lump of a building, the Wales Millennium Centre. Now this may look good on your telly, but there's no real architecture here. It's all cosmetic. It's really just a series of boxes in fancy dress. God is in the details, and that's where this building really falls apart. It's in niggly little bits like this corner here, where all the platelets come together and the lines don't match up. Now, if an architect was involved in all the details right to the last minute, that kind of thing wouldn't have happened. Shouldn't we worry about all the other public projects going up around the country? Britain's embarking on its biggest programme of public buildings since the 60s. So what kind of schools, hospitals and public buildings can we expect in the future? Maybe ones like the Cumberland Infirmary, where sewage flooded the operating theatre. Or Mayan's Primary School, where a roof collapsed in a teaching area. And this one, London's University College Hospital. Even the people that built it think it's flawed. Fine, keep taxpayers' budgets under control, but don't strangle ambition. Architects are the only ones who could construct beautifully designed buildings economically and to last. Cut out the middlemen. And the government's official advisers agree. Things that crop up repetitively are clients who don't have the experience are faced by a very daunting, complex task. They often then set unrealistic budgets, usually over-optimistic. And what happens is certainly decision-making frequently gets forced down to talk about lowest cost, rather than looking like the whole value of the building over a whole 25-year period and what could be achieved. So is the government really listening now? <laughs> That's a very telling question, I mean, an answer even. <laughs> Joking apart, following years of lobbying, Gordon Brown is no longer playing deaf. Design and build is now being used less, and the Treasury has signalled that it's considering reforming how PFI building projects are run. About time too. The National Assembly of Wales just about gets away with it. But if the government doesn't act, we could end up with a future where public buildings are hideous, badly functioning and falling apart. So wake up if you don't care about this you should. These are our public buildings. They should be built to last. That's real value for money. Sounds like off report.